Hello, everybody. My guest today is a story artist and director. He worked on known TV shows like The Walking Dead and Stranger Things. Also, projects like Creep Show, Dynasty, Cold of Chucky, Little Rascals, Woody Woodpecker, The Waterboy, and also Steven Spielberg's Sea Quest, Deep Sea Voyager, and more. He is known as the godfather of storyboarding, and it's a real privilege having him on today's show. So, please welcome to the show, Mark Simon. Hey, Vit, thanks for having me. Hey, Mark. Awesome to have you here, mate. I've had many, many guests uh, on the show now since I started this whole podcasting thing, but I've never had anybody from a movie industry. So it's definitely exciting to have you here today. And, uh, and uh, you know, with what you've done, I've got a bunch of great questions. Really interested to know how did you come about, I guess. How did you get into storyboarding? Well, I've, I've always been an artist and I've always loved telling stories. And uh, when I was a kid, I was actually helping my dad build custom homes. That's what we, uh, that's what the family business was. And so when I left college, I thought, well, Hollywood sounds really cool. So I just moved. I didn't know anyone. I'd never been there. I just sold everything I had and I moved mm -hmm. to LA and, uh, I knew I could get into the industry as an art director, designing and building sets because of my background in building homes. And I'd studied theater in college. So uh, that's what I did. And my first movie at Roger Corman studio, I became the art director on my first movie. And uh, I did that for years. But what I, what started happening was I missed drawing. I mean, I was designing, but I wasn't drawing and sketching. But I was seeing a lot of storyboards at that point, and, and I didn't really know, know anything about storyboarding prior to working in Hollywood. So I found an agency, the biggest agency in the world out in Los Angeles called Storyboards, Inc., and I, I just walked in, and I talked an agent into training me. And I just kept going back every week until my stuff was good enough, and he started to place me. And I transitioned from art directing into storyboarding. And it's been just an absolute blast ever since. Because now I get to work with the best directors and writers and producers, telling stories, sketching, and it's just being part of the creative development storytelling process of these movies and TV shows. I love every minute of it. And that's the stuff like for those listening, obviously, storyboard. That's like those little sketches for every single scenes before they shoot, shoot those scenes, right? Yeah, it is. I mean, the way I, I usually describe it is it's like a comic book version of a script before it's shot, but it's the director's vision. So it's my job to get into the director's head and illustrate it for the rest of the two or 300 people who are working on it. So everyone's working towards one singular vision. Because, you know, Vit, if you read a book or a script and I read one, we would see totally different things in our mind. Mm. But what matters is the director's vision. So I have to pull those images out of the director's head and illustrate it so everyone knows what he or she wants. So does that mean that before it goes out to anybody else in the production team, it's really about you and the director having you know discussions and re that's how you really get to understand that vision? Yeah, I share an office with the directors usually on, on these projects and we spend a lot of time together. We'll walk the locations and we'll walk the sets. We'll take photos. Some directors sketch out their own things. Other times we do overhead plot plans and we figure out where the actors and cameras are going to be. Other times uh, they'll just be describing what they want to me and I'm sketching it as they're, as they're talking. Other times we watch movies that they want to emulate and say, oh, see this shot here and oh, see that shot there. And, it, and I've got just a million uh, things, uh, tricks of the trade to figure out what it is that they want. I mean, it's a yeah visual representation. And when people are, you can't just tell them and explain it in, in words, right? So having that, having that picture, that initial idea of that scene and what that looks going to look like, that makes perfect sense. Um, yeah. What goes into a storyboarding, a show like Walking Dead? Well, it's interesting. It's, it, it's a much faster process than most people think. So The Walking Dead is it's an hour-long show. In hour-long shows, you've got duplicates of certain aspects of the show, like you have two sets of, 
of episode producers, two sets of first assistant directors, two sets of, of directors of photography. And the reason is, so for instance, on The Walking Dead, we shoot an entire episode in eight days. Mm. That means we have eight days of prep per show because every director, we alternate directors. So director A has eight days of prep. And then director A moves into eight days of shooting. Director B comes in for eight days of prep while the other crew is shooting. So we're always overlapping. There's never a day off. So the scripts are never done on day one of prep. So generally, day three of prep, they have a pretty good version of the script. They call me to make sure I'm available for day four. So I show up on day four having read the script. I, uh, and then I start going through only the scenes that have stunts and special effects and fancy camera moves because there's not enough time to storyboard an entire hour-long episode. So we just pick the things that are needed most for budgeting and scheduling, uh, the hardest shots to do. And then I'll spend generally three or four days storyboarding. And I also produce animatics, which is like a video version of the storyboard with some motion. And I'm because I work so fast, I'm able to provide more than most people who are storyboarding. So I give them a lot to be able to work with. And the directors love it because they can actually see are the shots working. They see it play out just like the finished the finish piece will look. Right, so you, you, you're basically scribbling on some sort of a computer, not just on a, on a piece of paper, and then it becomes uh, animated uh, a scene. Is that right? Yeah, uh, the, the, the software that we use is Storyboard Pro, and it's, it's, it was made for animation. And then I came in and worked with the engineers at the software company to help them make it work for live action because there's a number of differences between the two. So I helped on the development of it. So it works the way I want it to work, which is really, I, I love working with the software. So as I'm drawing, it's kind of like a combination of Photoshop, um, After Effects, which is a compositing software, and Premiere, which is an editing software. So it's like all three together. So as I'm drawing, it's on a timeline. I can add audio and change timings, move things around, and still export it out in a way that production needs to be able to use without ever leaving one software. So it saves me a tremendous amount of time, which is why I'm able to offer clients so much. Productivity is key. And being yeah. being nimble and, and efficient is a key in any business. I mean, this is a business for you, right? So yeah, yeah. Look, I do. So I've worked on over five thousand productions now, um, and I wrote the main book on the industry. I do the LinkedIn Learning videos on how to do storyboarding. I mean, I'm I'm out there trying to teach people all the time. My life is storyboarding. I just I love doing it, and I love teaching others to do it. That's awesome, Mark. I'm. With all the shows that you've done, I'm very curious. Obviously, I'm very curious about your own personal story, and I want to get into that in a second. But while we are on that topic of you know sure. storyboarding and, and, and your career in the industry, um, what is it like working with uh, Steven Spielberg? Well, I mean, it's pretty awesome. Now, when I was working with Steven, he didn't direct any of the episodes. He was uh, producing. So everything I did with him was long distance. The show was uh, produced in, in Orlando in the second and third seasons. I worked on the second season. And Stephen was always out in L.A. because he was always doing his movies and whatever else he had going on. So, and that was in the years before, I didn't even think we had email back then because that was 92, 93. Yeah, right. So it was a lot of phone calls and a lot of overnight and a lot of faxing. Um, I guess there there was the ability to move files, but we had to go through someone else to do it. It was, you know, those were those are the olden days of doing production. Uh, we didn't even have Photoshop back then. Yeah, right. So it was <laughs> it was really different. I was drawing on paper at that time um, because there was no storyboarding software, and I and I've always been at the forefront of technology. So. You know, like when I was art directing, I was the first art director to use a fax machine in Hollywood. I was the first art director in, in Orlando to start using computers. So if I was still on paper, that's all we had back then. But it was so cool to send him because uh, I also did all the concept designs for the show in the second season. So I would send him these uh, really intricate paintings and, and color illustrations of all these major locations. And I'd get his notes back and just be able to communicate with, you know, the God of filmmaking 
was a dream come true. I mean, he's, he's just the best living director in my eyes. So yeah, what a treat. Absolutely. That would have been for sure. Yeah. Now back to you. How did it all came? Okay, obviously you, you worked for your dad in, in a construction company and that's where you sort of got the, the, the skills of building sets and then sort of you segue it into what you enjoy doing, which is, you know, uh, paintings and that resulted in storyboarding. But how did, let's, let's rewind back even, even earlier. Um, right. Cause you've got an interesting story of your own. Yeah. So you're talking about the bullying, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. So, so like a lot of people, I was bullied in high school. Um, my story kind of got much more intense than most people luckily ever have to deal with. So I was a, a short kid in school. I'm not tall now, but I was really short in high school. And there was this one gang of guys that were just ruthless. I mean, there were reports and I talked to the families of, you know, they would be not only just beat up other kids, but snap their legs. Uh, there's this one kid, they jumped on his thigh on a curb and snapped his femur. Um, there were uh, stores. I talked to the managers where they had beaten up all the patrons who were shopping and, and buying food. Um, they would throw bricks and, and cinder blocks off of uh, overpasses. I mean, these were not nice people. And they would try to pick on me in school. Now, I was small, but because I worked construction, I was just solid muscle. And I was used to running crews of guys two and three times my age who weighed over 300 pounds of solid muscle. So it took a lot to intimidate me because of what I was used to doing. And, and no one at school knew what I did for mm -hmm. a living. You know, no one talked about that kind of stuff. You know, it was really unusual for, you know, 16-year-old to be running a construction company. Um, you know, no one even thought about that. So I know I had a different lifestyle growing up. So when they would try to pick on me, like, you know, trying to body check me and, uh, when we were playing basketball and stuff like that, they were used to just intimidating people so they could have the run. I would just duck my shoulder and the guy would, you know, knock himself across the court when he tried to push me. So they got embarrassed. And when those bullies got embarrassed, they didn't stop they started coming two, three, four, eight people at a time after me. Yeah, right. So there was a, uh, and, and I'll, I'll fill, I'll, I'll tell you it's a medium length version of this story just because there's a lot of really interesting things. Yeah. So in high school, in my school, we had this area called the Back of Bamel. And this was an unfinished subdivision. They had, they'd put in the roads, but hadn't built any homes. And it was filled with trees so we could all hide back there. So we would all drive back into this area and build a big bonfire every Saturday night. It was a great place for everyone to go drinking and partying and hooking up. And I was back there one night and I heard, as I'm talking to these girls, I was sitting in my, uh, in my old Thunderbird. I'd rebuilt a classic car. It was a 1963 Thunderbird. It was, it was like a Cadillac of its time because it had electric windows, even though it was a 1963 and the, the, the buttons for the windows were on the center console rather than on the door, which was really important for what actually ended up happening. I'll have to Google to that. <laughs> yeah. So in fact, in my book, I've got, I've got photos of the car in the dash because people had to, to really understand. You have to see in your mind how everything worked. Hmm. So I, what I, as I'm talking to these girls in my car, I hear, Hey, there's Simon. Let's rumble. And the next thing I know, there are guys on both sides of my windows leaning in and punching me and my buddy who was in the car with me. People crawling up over the car with bats and bashing on my windows and on the top of my car. And I was completely surrounded. So I yelled at my buddy, roll up the window. And so we both leaned into the center of the car away from the windows. And I grabbed uh, one of the guys, his name is Perry, who's one of the ringleaders. I grabbed Perry's arm. And when I leaned over, I hit the button and rolled up the window on his arm and I trapped his arm in my car. Then I put it in gear and floored it and I drug him down the road. But it was a road that was filled with, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 high schoolers partying. So most people had no idea what was going on. So they're all diving out of the way and throwing their bottles at me thinking that I'm the crazy one, not realizing I'm literally running for my life. 
one of their friends jumped in front of my car to try to stop me, guy who knew it was going on. So I ran over him. I actually remember watching his face smash against my windshield as he bounced off my bumper. He rolled off the left-hand side, hit Perry, and pulled Perry out of the window. They bounced off into a car, and I tried to exit, but I missed the exit road to get out of the subdivision. I spun my car around, and they pulled two vehicles up and blocked the exit. And there was no way out because there was a ditch along the, along the, uh, the main road. It was just empty lots and then a ditch and then the main road. And they, everyone was pulling bats and chains, burning boards out of the fire and tire irons. So I felt like the Frankenstein monster and the villagers were after me because all I saw was a silhouette of all these people with weapons coming at me. And I told my buddy, I said, hang on. I floored it, jumped the curb, drove across the empty lots. And there was just, there was a slight berm on the ed edge of the, of the ditch, you know, the drainage ditches on either side of the road. There was a slight yep. berm there. Luckily, I hit that berm and my, I lurched my 1963 T-Bird in the air and landed it in the middle of the road as all these other cars are swerving around us trying to avoid hitting me. Wow, it sounds like <laughs> scenes from an action movie, right? <laughs> I know, it was, it was insane what was going on. So we're freaking out. I drive, I drop my buddy off at his house, who was just a, a block away from where I lived. I pull into my driveway and I run in the side door because it was we lived on a on a big corner lot. Uh, and I, I run in, I I always talk to my parents whenever I came came home from a night out. So they were in their bedroom and uh, you know, just in their robes. And as I come as I run in, I, I'm out of breath. Mom instantly goes, What's wrong? What's going on? I start trying to tell them, but I don't get anything out. And we hear this noise out front. My mom says, I hear something out front. So she goes out the side door instead of the front door and looks around and sees four guys, a pickup in the front yard and four guys in our yard. And mom yells, get your dad. There's someone here messing with our house. So I yell for dad. He puts on his robe and his glasses. He's barefoot. He comes running out, and I hear the guys go, hey, there's the old man. Let's get out of here. All four jump in the truck and start trying to take off. My dad chases the truck down, grabs one of the guys out of the back of the truck with one arm, and pulls him out. He was a farm boy. It's just, again, solid muscle and working with, uh, with me in construction all those mm -hmm. years. And he just holds him there. The truck stops. The other three get out. So my dad, again, doesn't know what had happened that night. This kid starts screaming and cursing at him like dad had never heard. I mean, it was they were obviously all high on something. And it was just crazy, smacking and hitting and slapping my dad, spitting on him, telling him, you know, I'm going to I'm going to kill your son. I'm going to burn your house down, you know, and, uh, and I, I'm, but but unbelievable amounts of cursing in there. The other three come out. One of the guys takes my mom, throws her up against a tree and starts slapping her around. Another guy comes and starts, and I'm totally freaked out at this point. So another guy comes and he's hitting me up against a tree. And there's just screaming and uh, like crazy in our front yard until our neighbor's here. And one of our neighbors, uh, Corrine, uh, she was probably four or five years older than me, was dating a guy from college. He was visiting. His name was Kyle. Kyle comes out swinging a three foot pipe that they had in their garage. And between my dad and Kyle, the guys leave threats back and forth. We're going to be back. We're going to kill you. All this kind of stuff. Five minutes later, the cops show up. We tell them what was going on. One of the cops that comes by is a cop that all of us in high school knew. His name was officer Ogden. I'll never forget him really big rotund guy, but he was a friend of everybody, right? So we all knew Ogden. So he says, uh, he said, well, we'll look around, see if we can find them. Would you mind if I come by tomorrow? So Ogden came by but just before lunch the next day, sat us down and said, look, Mark's in trouble. Everyone's talking about him because he had heard all the guys talk and he hung out most of the time at McDonald's. One of the reasons he was so large. And 
uh, said, you know, they're all talking. I'm even hearing the threats. I suggest that you hire a uh, private security to watch the house. We'll send patrols by, but you probably need someone here all the time. There's a new law that I would recommend you take advantage of because you need to nip this in the bud before someone gets seriously hurt. And it's a law that will hold parents responsible for the actions of their kids, but there's some steps we have to do. The parents have to be warned in court before you can actually charge them because they have to have the opportunity to deal with it. So they can't just say, well, I had no idea what little Johnny was doing. So that's what we did. He talked to the uh, judge himself and uh, we were able to set a court date on a sa- on the following Saturday. So within a week, we were able to get the initial warning. Now, in the meantime, my dad hires private security to sit in a driveway two houses away from us to watch the house and scare people away. During that week, my mom is finding uh, death threats on the doors, death threats on our, on our cars. The guys are trying to attack me in school. The administration let me stay uh, or let me park in the teacher's lot so I would sneak in and out of school every day because the guys were slashing my tires. They were trying to uh, waylay me outside the school doors. I, it, was, it was just horrible. And everyone stopped talking to me at the school. I mean, completely. I was like the lonely island walking. And this is a school of 4,000 kids. It was, a, it was the largest school in high school in Texas at the time. Is that because all the all the bullies had the big influence on all the other kids? So everyone was afraid of retribution or getting involved. Yeah, right. They just they so they just avoided me. They wouldn't even look at me. So that freaked me out even more. So we warned them in court. So we bring four families in, the four that showed up at our house that night. Uh, not the whole 30 that attacked me the week before, or uh, but the four that showed up at the house. One family or two of the families dealt with their kids instantly when they realized what was going on. They got shut down. But the two ringleaders, Steve and Perry, they only had mothers. Their mothers were nasty as hell. One of the mothers called me a pussy in court for not standing up and just fighting my own fight. That tells you everything you need to know about how these guys were raised. And the judge said, if you attack the Simons and they call us, you are going to jail the, to the parents, to the mothers. You're right. You know, that's how the law works. And they just, pfft, these kids need to do their own thing. And that was it. So we walked out. And so the judge sat me down and talked to me and he said, look, this is up to you on when it happens. Unfortunately, it needs to be pretty serious so that if we do have them arrested, it's going to stick. And we can have them thrown in jail. So it can't be just looking at you sideways. Mm. So the, the administration and my parents also sat me down um, and said, do you want to change schools? I said, no. Why should I have to uproot my life because of those assholes? Then they win. I'm not going to let them win. My life is going to come back to normal. I'm going to screw up their lives. I'm not going to let this change how I live my life, even though for those months that this was going on, it completely ruined my life. So it, there, were, there were a number of times they attacked me, but not in a way that I thought I could have, I could have something stick. I probably should have, you know, like they broke into someone's house and four of them jumped me. Um, but it wasn't until eight of them jumped me uh, when I was on a date. And they came after me with weapons. Um, and I actually suffered a nervous breakdown on that last one because it was just too much for me to handle. I was going to say, how can you cope with all that? And not, not- it, it was it was <laughs> tough. I mean, I started failing classes, which kind of leads into what, what you were bringing up. But because I was look, I was a straight A student. Uh, I was at the top of the uh, top of my class, not the very top, but we had brilliant guys I went to high school with. But I was in all the honors classes. But during that, in particularly math, I couldn't think because they would show up outside my classes and just stare at me and flip me off and make threats. And of course, I can't think about anything on a test. So I'm miserably failing. 
So I fail one of my honors math classes. And I was a mathlete. I mean, I competed in math competitions. So to fail that of all things was devastating. So they, they attacked me that last time, what I called the final straw. We called them up. And I called my parents. I said, that's it. Call the cops. I've had it. Put those bitches in jail. Hmm. So they did. The parents, were, uh, the mothers were, uh, the ringleaders were arrested. They, we set a court date for December. We go in for, uh, for the court date. And um, at this point, it's been going for how long? 12 months? Two and a half months. Right. Of just solid hell. I mean, you know, in the meantime, we, uh, my entire family got trained in shooting weapons. Um, so we, we had guns hidden behind every door in the house. When, uh, I had one friend who became my lifetime best friend through all this, Jim. He brought his, uh, his guns over. He was the only one who would even talk to me. So he basically lived at our house for a while to help us watch over the house. Plus, we had private security sitting outside. Um, we carried weapons in our cars. I had a weapon um, that I would carry in school. It wasn't a gun or knife, obviously, but I had this uh, iron slug with a point on one end that I would carry in my pocket as a protection. Um, not a good way to live. You know, we couldn't no. sleep at night because we had to watch, watch ourselves. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, my, my mother would follow me around whenever, whenever I was driving to and from school. She'd follow me in her car with a loaded 38 snub nose revolver in the seat next to her. So we win the first, first trial when uh, the, the attorney for one of the mothers says, says the, it, the equivalent of have you stopped beating your wife yet, which is there's no good answer. <laughs> you know, yes, I've stopped beating her, which means I had, or no, I haven't stopped beating her, which means I still am. He said, are you proud of your son? And this has been going on for a while. You know, there's a, it was a long court trial, but when he gets to the point and he says, are you proud of your son? I looked at dad and I said, oh my God, we just won this trial, didn't we? Because that is, yes, I'm proud of him means that she's okay with the fact that he's attacking my family. Or no, I'm not proud of him, which means I can't control my son for attacking this family. And that was it. The trial was over. We won. She was drug off to jail. The other mother pled no contest and uh, to all counts. And we kept a couple counts outstanding. So if they even looked at me crossways, they were in jail again. So we win. My life pretty much goes back to normal, except for two weeks later. Right at the end of school, of, of the fall semester, I'm going up one of the staircases, these giant staircases, because obviously we have so many kids in the school, and I get hit from behind. Now, the, the ringleaders are gone. They were immediately removed from school and from the school district, uh, and they never came back. So I was at least able to do that and got rid of them for everyone in the school. Um, but these two guys, huge guys, I had no idea who they were. I had never seen them before slam me against the wall. My books go flying. They grab me by the shoulder, spin me around and slam me repeatedly against the door and get in my face. They lean in and start going, what do you do, Simon? What do you do? Huh? huh? You can have my parents arrested too? Huh? You can do it to me too? And I was totally freaking out until they said that. Once they said, are you going to do it to us too? A calm came over me and I smiled. And I leaned towards them and up at them because, I mean, they were huge in comparison to me. And I, I look at them, I smile, and I'm going, you fuck with me? Yeah, I'll do it to you too. And their faces just went blank. They took a step back away from me and just stood there. I picked up my stuff, I smiled, and I ran up the stairs. And that was the last time anyone ever messed with me in high school. So now leading to my career, when I start the spring semester in high school, this is my junior year in high school, I have an extra class because I failed math. Being an artist, I picked up an extra period of art, which in my art had gotten really dark during this time period. You can oh. see a progression <laughs> of my art getting really dark. I can imagine. Which, and I show that in my book too, in my memoir. I show the artwork so you can see what's going on in my mind. It's a great book, by the way. I've looked into it. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, so my art teacher 
knew me and knew everything that I did, all my extracurricular work, you know, working with my dad. And, and I actually had an advertising company I'd started when I was in high school as well, doing, uh, doing flyers and signage for my dad's clients and things. Mm-hmm. She said, you know, the theater department needs someone to design a poster and a program for them. Why don't you do it? You can just take this last period of yours and you can go hang out down, down there and get some inspiration. I thought, yeah, that sounds great. So I'd go down there and I was sitting on, on, the, uh, on the foot of the stage, sketching up ideas for the poster and stuff. And I'm watching them design and build the sets for uh, Fiddler on the Roof. And being a guy who designed things, I start making comments. You know, if you, it'll be stronger if you do it this way. You know, that's not the best way to build this. And so I went from just designing the posters to slowly working my way into designing. to then I ended up building the sets. Then I ended up being the backstage manager of running the crews because I was re- used to running crews. That's what I did in construction. So I got all of a sudden I am just completely enthralled with theater, and I'm and these now are my new friends because there was a whole different side of school. They didn't know anything about me. They didn't know me beforehand. They didn't know the gang. They had no idea what had happened. So they welcomed me with open arms. Like so now I've life. got a whole new life, all new friends, and the new love for telling stories and working in theater. I had never even seen a play leading up to that. So that led me into then getting a scholarship to college in theater. So I studied that, the theater and film in college. So when I graduated college, I thought, oh, I got to give Hollywood a shot. That sounds cool. So those attacks literally led me to Hollywood into the career that I have now. Well, pretty much. The way it sounds like it couldn't have been any other way. Yeah. I mean, that was it. So, I mean, and back to you leading, uh, you know, managing a, a team of uh, guys on a construction company, they would have been older. You would have been like 16. Yeah. I was six. Well, I was 14 when I became superintendent. Um, I was, dad had a superintendent and I was, uh, I was his lead worker. And, but the superintendent do, didn't do much work. He would just drop me off and then he'd come pick me up and he would babysit his own kids while he's collecting the big paycheck. And I remember my parents were, were talking about, wow, you, you know, uh, what, what's his name? I can't remember his name now. Um, he said, wow, he's doing a great job. And I said, with what? And they said, well, this, this, and this. I said, well, I did all that. I said, what do you mean you did all that? Yeah, I said, he just drops me off. Everything you just said was me. And mom looked at dad and said, why are we paying him if Mark's doing all this work? And dad said, well, I, it's a good question. So they ended up firing him, gave me the position of what I was already doing. So I would literally drive to, to the work sites in the morning before school, get the jobs going, drive to school, then drive back to the job sites, wrap them up, and then drive home for dinner. So I, and, and that started when I was in junior high. I didn't have a driver's license. Dad just said, don't be an idiot behind the wheel. You'll never get pulled over and just gave me the work truck. Yeah, right. So I had a a really different upbringing, but that's also why I dealt with the gang the way I did and, and not having them intimidate me to start with because I was running these job sites, you know, in, in, for this multi-million dollar construction company, you know, from when I was an early teen. So it was, it was a really different and bizarre set of circumstances and background for me. It's yeah, it definitely sounds bizarre. I mean, this type of stuff. I mean, you would you wouldn't get away these days, I reckon, having an under eighteen running a construction site. But I guess it was your dad's company, and and yeah, the most important thing I think on the on the plus side is him giving you that that trust. That wouldn't that would have helped you much or much quicker, right? In those in those years. Look, it gave me a, a huge amount of confidence that I could do anything. Yeah. So, you know, and, and when I'm standing, you know, toe to, uh, toe to chest with this muscle bound guy who's three times my age telling him what to do, some punk in high school trying to body check me in basketball doesn't mean anything to me. Right. And I had a smart mouth you know, because of it, too. So they, you know, the gang didn't like it. They intimidated everybody but me. So it just kept ramping up until they decided to attack me. To make a point. And what were those kids? I mean, that's very unusual. I mean, 30 kids being so against you, or like really having you as a target. What do you know what drove them? Like, was it just fun for them or 
Well, look, they were one of the things that came out in the court trial was that they prior to attacking me, they had broken into the school and broke into uh, the records room and burned their own school records. So they would do all sorts of things. And, and it's interesting, since the book came out, I've been hearing from a lot of people who didn't know what was going on with me, but knew, not only knew what had happened, but some of these, some people who reached out to me had also been attacked by these guys, but had never done anything about it. So they're getting a relief going, oh my God, someone actually took care of this. And, and, it's made, and, and, and it's opened up a dialogue where I can now talk with them and they can talk with me in a way they've never been able to talk to anyone before. So it's interesting, 40 years later, because this year celebrates 40 years since those attacks, and, um, which is why I was the first one in the country, in, in the United States, to use that law to hold parents responsible for the actions of their kids. So I set a precedent on how you can do it. And then I went around and talked to, uh, I think it was four other families and seven local businesses and showed them what to do. The very same people who would not come to court to support me because they didn't want to get involved. I mean, it, which really pissed me off. They would not support me until I won. Now they were really willing to listen. So I went and I talked to every one of them again. And I helped every one, every one of them with how to do it. Wow. Now, bullying is still a thing these days on schools. So, yeah, especially with cyber now. The, the cyber bullying is really big. Right, yeah. Social media, yeah. that stuff. Even resulting in, in young people's suicide just because somebody yeah. is saying nasty stuff about it on Facebook. What do you think that these days would help with that? <sighs> well, for the, one of the biggest issues that kids run into is they don't feel they can tell anyone. So the first thing a kid should do is tell adults. Tell, start with your own, uh, own family, your own parents. And if it's ha anything's happening in school, tell the administration. Now, unfortunately, not everyone has the support that I had. My parents completely supported me. My administration, my principal showed up at my court trial for me. So I had a lot of support. Not everyone is that way. Um, there's, I, I, I'm in communication with a lot of people on Facebook who there's there's a couple of different bullying groups that I'm a member of and I'm trying to help people there on how to get through it. And some of them went to administration and they're not helped at all. But at least give it a shot. Try it. You know, because you, you don't know if pe you're not giving people an opportunity to help you unless you actually tell them. Now, if you're unfortunate enough where people don't support you, go to the cops. There are different laws in different countries, and even in the United States, every state differs. If it gets bad enough, I used a law to help me. There's probably a law that can help you too. But start with the people closest to you. I think one of the hardest things for those kids is if, they're, if they've been bullied a lot, they might be in that headspace where they really think saying anything is just going to, you know, in the surrounding they well, might feel yeah, like it's going to be a weak, even like it's a weak thing to do. They might think that, you know. Here's what I tell people who think that, because look, everything went through my mind. You know, I, I was the victim like a lot of other people are. Mm. It takes a stronger person to stand up against these people and to stand up and say something than the people who are bullying. It actually shows strength for you to go and talk to people and demand they help you. Try not to be a victim any more than, than you already are. I don't like victim blaming. I don't like the idea of victim blaming. It happens way too much. In too many schools like the, uh, have, have rules like um, uh, that there's zero tolerance for fighting. Well, zero tolerance for fighting means if you fight back, you also get in trouble. Well, that only helps the bullies. It's a ridiculous, terrible, and lazy way for schools to work. That needs to end immediately. And if, if you're being attacked, you must be able to either fight back or do, uh, do what's necessary and not worry about getting in trouble. Mm. Now, most yeah, people, I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, so that's one thing that needs to happen in the school systems. 
But if you're willing to stand up and say something, that means you're stronger than they are. So we need to look at this differently. Let's change the way people look at strength and weakness and, and victims and give people the strength to do what they need to do. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I mean, there's some, there's some programs, governments, they have different, different governments around the world, have different programs, but hopefully it would be nice to have a, a world one day where this type of stuff just doesn't happen, right? Yeah, or at least be able to shut it down. Uh, like I said, I got the guys kicked out of the entire school district. They couldn't come to any school in our area. Um, so, and, and look, my administration, uh, the, our, my principal was working on that anyway, but being able to take care of that in a court of law just gave him so much ammunition that, that no one could argue it. Yeah. I mean, your story is so powerful that I really hope that somebody listening right now, um, some young kid, you know, having been in a tough sport, hopefully, you know, this episode um, helps inspire them to take action and take courage. And Yeah. And look, it's not always easy, but it's, it's easier to, and it's shorter to fight a hard fight for a short period of time than to live with the anguish and pain of not doing anything. So, you know, I got on with my life because I dealt with it. So if you don't, because if you don't deal with it, it gets worse and it builds up in your mind and everything is bigger in your head than it usually ever is in real life. Well, unfortunately, my real life was pretty freaking bad. Um, but you need to talk to people about it. In fact, how to get over it is a big thing too. Because there's a sense, there's a, a PTSD, you know, post-traumatic stress syndrome for people who are severely bullied and assaulted like I was. You know, I, for years, I had to keep looking over my shoulder because I thought someone was coming up behind me because that happened to me so many times. Mm. And I couldn't sit in a movie theater for a long time because I was afraid someone was going to knife me in the dark. So I wrote my story down. Uh, it, And because, you know, it took, look, it took me 40 years to write my memoir, not because I was suffering from it. I got over this a long, long time ago, but I wasn't a good enough storyteller to do what I felt my, uh, to do justice the way I felt my story needed. So long, decades ago, I wrote the story from beginning to end and it was terrible. It was not a good story the way it was written, but by writing it down, when I got to the end, I had flushed my system of any pain or, or bad memories because my mind no longer had, had to hold on to it. It was there. It was written down. My mind could let it go because I could always go to this written document. Writing things down is amazingly cathartic. I can't tell you what a difference. I mean, literally, it freed me. I never had a bad night's sleep or a bad dream from the moment I wrote the end. So I, I tell everybody. Please write down what happened to you, and that releases your mind. And that could be that first step, writing it down. It gives you a bit more confidence to actually speak up and tell somebody else, even if it's later in the years, in your adulthood. It's important, I guess, like you said. Otherwise, you're, you're bottling those things in your head, and yeah. that's affecting everything you do in your adulthood. I Absolutely. can definitely relate to it. I was The other day, I was actually thinking about that. I was talking to somebody, and... We talked about these type of things, you know, and bullying in, you know, in, in school. And, and I remember I never really thought about, you know, myself, but uh, I remembered, you know, there was that experience that I've come across myself. You know, one day I was, uh, there was this shortcut that I would always take across the uh, school playground. But, you know, after the school hours, it was always locked. So I would climb over the fence, walk across the school playground, climb over the other side. It was just a shortcut, you know. Mm -hmm. One day I did that, and there was a you know bunch of bunch of um, a bunch of kids um, playing. Bunch of um, we got a couple of you know quite a, a lot of gypsies in Czech Republic. Not that they're all bad, but this particular bunch of kids they were playing, uh, you know, playing soccer, and uh, it was, I think it was brothers or something. And one of them kicked the ball towards me, maybe by accident. Anyway, they sort of shouted at me if I can kick it back. So I just said, yeah, no problem. I just kicked the ball back, but for some reason, they uh, they decided they just wanted to punch somebody. So like, what did you say to my brother? 
I said I didn't say anything. I, I just I just said, yeah, I'm gonna kick the ball back. And before I realized, I had four of them around me, mm. punching me in my face, in my head, and all I could do because it was four of them, I just you know covered up. Right. And you know when they sort of start punching, I run away. But um, yeah, realized sort of just sharing that story, um, writing it down like yeah, definitely made feel like something shifted because uh. And it was only like in re- recently, in the last few years, that I've done that. Uh, because up until that point, I never realized, you know, that's actually affecting certain things. You know, it's amazing how even just one incident like that can stick with you for so many years. Hundred percent. I mean, the feeling of uh, what's the word? You know, helplessness. You oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. And when you're, I think I was fourteen at the time. Mm-hmm. It's and when you don't tell anyone, it's it's a terrible thing because yeah, it just bottles up and yeah, you know it's. I mean, I got through it. I I got myself clinched onto a sport and I started break dancing and that was my outlet. But uh, yeah, until you really sort of let it out, like you know, speak to somebody, it's um, mm-hmm. it's always going to be there affecting your uh, your confidence. So. You don't even realize said things. I mean, that's when we talk about like neuro linguistic programming. It's a kind of similar, I guess, in a way where, like they say about neuro linguistic programming, it's based on, I mean, language and based how you've been raised, based on your mm-hmm. experiences in your childhood. They they affect how you how you, how you act in your in your adulthood. So, um, as a result of you writing that book. What's happened since? Well, uh, you know, the book ju- it just came out a couple of weeks ago. So, what, but what I've been hearing is from a lot of people who have been bullied, who have reached out and uh, been asking, you know, how I got over it and how I dealt with it. And uh, like I'd mentioned earlier, I've been hearing from a lot of people who had also been attacked and affected by the same guys that attacked me. Mm. And it's giving them a sense of relief to be able to talk to someone about it and open up and tell stories that they've never told anyone before. So it's, uh, it's, it's been really quite heartwarming to be a part of helping someone get over something that has affected them for so many years. Have you been approached by any schools, like asking for maybe some speaking geek? Like you know, talking to students. Not yet, but uh, you know, I'm most likely I I will at some point. But like I said, the book just came out, so yeah. um, you know, it we're in the we're in the very early days of even letting people know about it. So what's the for the listeners? What's the book called? It's called Attacked, and uh, um, it's on Amazon, both in print and on Kindle, um, and it's attacked with an exclamation point. Although you'll find it even if you don't say that. So if you just look for that in my name, Mark Simon, it's easy to find. I'll make sure I'll put it in the show notes. Cool. Yeah, Very in fact, cool. I've got the, my website has uh, the first chapter for free for anyone if they want to read it. And videos. In fact, I've been posting more and more videos of the locations where everything happened. I've been guiding people through it. And that's at MarkSimonBooks.com. I'll make sure I'll put that in the, in the show notes as well. Mark, um, what are you working on these days? Anything exciting from a movie perspective? Anything we can look forward to? I've really enjoyed, um, you know, the uh, Stranger Things TV show. I hope they're going to make another. I really like the second series. Are you working on a third series? <laughs> I'm. It's actually the fourth season. I am working on it. If, well, we were until the shutdown. Uh, the entire industry shut down. So I'm waiting on on when that show comes back into production, and I'll be back on that again. Uh, yeah, right. I just got a call to work on a Woody Woodpecker 2 uh, just I don't a couple know days that one. ago. I what is that one? Uh, it's a live action CG combination uh, of the character Woody Woodpecker. Yep. So uh, so they're doing another. I storyboarded the first movie, and they just asked me to come back and do the second one. So just waiting on the script to be finished in the next couple of weeks on that. Uh, I've been consulting on a few projects. I literally just finished a direct um, uh, animation director on a music video, which is now in the festival circuit called a Sparrow's Tale. So hopefully that'll be hitting uh, later this summer. That'll start airing and uh, screening in, in 
um, in places. So uh, that and still working on my LinkedIn learning courses. I've got a bunch of courses there to help people with everything from animation to storyboarding to voiceovers. So and they can find that on your things. website? Yeah, yeah. Links to all that kind of stuff is on my website. Oh, excellent. No, that's awesome. Yeah. Now, any advice you'd like to give somebody who is looking to um, start a business? Uh, yeah, so if there's a, two things. One, learn aspects of the business you may not want to learn, like accounting and marketing, because it doesn't matter what you do, you're in marketing. And accounting is simply understanding where your money is coming and going. And it's very easy for someone to steal your money if you don't understand accounting. So it's hugely important. That's one thing I told both my boys. Study anything you want, but you're also studying business because no matter what you do, those things are relevant. And the other thing is, if you want to work in a business, don't just start it. Work for someone good in that field and make connections and learn how they're doing how, what they do right and what they do wrong. It's much easier to start a business if you already have connections. When you leave, you can leave with clients. So, you know, you've got to do some learning. I've seen way too many people just have an idea with no experience or knowledge. And most of those businesses are going to fail within the first year. But if you, if you understand the business from the inside out, and you can start it with at least one good client, you have a much better chance of succeeding. Now, I'm a fitness guy, and mm -hmm. running a business, it's a, you need a range of skills like accounting. Uh, but the physical shell that we, we're in, our bodies, are yep. just as important, right? How important is fitness to you? Well, it's been important my entire life. Uh, you know, I've always been active. Uh, I've been a lifelong skateboarder. In fact, I had my own line of skateboards when I was uh, a young teenager uh, before I started yeah, right. working with my dad. So, you know, I was highly competitive in that. Um, and I still have my regular and electric off-road skateboards. So I hit, I hit it up whenever I can. Uh, my whole family plays tennis together. So that's another way I stay fit. I've got here in my studio, I've got hand weights. Um, but one of the things I did when, uh, when my kids were really young, I got in, I, I'd studied different forms of martial arts when I was younger. And once my kids got to be about five, I got them into Taekwondo and I did it with them. So my boys and I went all the way up through second degree black belt together. Oh, nice. In Taekwondo. So that uh, got me back in good shape, uh, really good shape again. And we competed together. So all three of us won nationals a few times together, uh, in obviously different age categories. So, you know, those types of things have helped a lot. And, and, it, and I wanted my boys to have that sense of control of their body and, um, and respect. Martial arts, there's a lot of respect that you learn if you go to the right, the right schools. And that worked out really well. I mean, they turned out to be great kids and it was great time to spend together and it got me really fit again. Yeah, no, that's, and, and obviously they would have really good base for confidence. Absolutely. Yeah. So many, so many benefits to it. Mark, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Is there anything that I haven't asked that I should have? Oh, I don't know. Um, uh, we want gone over quite a few things. Oh, you know what? There is one thing. It yeah. was actually one of the questions that you talked about earlier. Uh, something that I, I wish I had known when I got started that I didn't. Yeah, yeah. And it's, sh what is it's schmoozing. I always had, you know, small talk with people schmoozing. I always right. had this thing when I, when I first moved out to LA that it was just nonsense. I hated it. I avoided it like, avoided it like the plague, not realizing how important that is. You mean like to talk about the weather and stuff like that? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's a way to break the ice. Because, look, when you meet somebody, they have all their own nonsense going on in their lives. So when you first meet someone, even if you've known them before, but when you first get together and you're first face-to-face, -face, you've got to do a moment of transition between what's been happening up until that moment in their life to then focusing on you. The last thing you want to do is start a sales pitch with someone 
when they're still worried about their dog or their wife that was just yelling at them or their yeah. boss that was just yelling at them, right? If you don't so relate to them, talk, you don't close anything. Yeah, exactly. So small talk is that transition between them thinking about something else to then focusing on you. And once you get that, you can see in someone's eyes when, okay, now, now I have your attention. That's when I'll start getting into my pitch presentation, whatever it is, because now they'll pay attention to all of it rather than clicking in halfway through or not paying attention at all. So that's helped tremendously for me to be able to break the ice with anybody and start a conversation. My kids are always saying, dad, you'll talk to anybody. Well, I will now. I didn't when I was their age, but now, yeah, I'll talk to anybody because you never know what'll happen. So I, now I love talking to people. I'll walk up to anybody. Hey, what do you do? What's, uh, what's up? What's going on here? You know, when I'm at a conference, I always say, what brings you here? Because that instantly tells me what kind of relationship we're likely to have at that conference. Can you help me or can I help you? Yeah. What brings you here? Well, I'm here looking for product. Great. I might have something for you. And it, it instantly takes you off. So if you've got that, depending on what situation you're in, a great just opening question, there's, you're, you don't have to be nervous anymore. Mm. Well, one of, one of the reasons I, I've decided to do these, um, well, we've done that, you know, a little, little phone call, pre-episode phone mm -hmm. call, is I thought it's a good opportunity to first and foremost get to know that person. That's you know, um, either somebody reaching out to be a guest on a show or uh, me looking to get a guest on the show. But, you know, having that conversation before we jump on the podcast podcast, gives me the opportunity to get to know that person better, see if there's good energy so we can like actually have a good conversation mm -hmm. rather than booking somebody straight up for the podcast if I've never talked to them, realizing we actually can't have a conversation because just there's just no energy, right? So right. you're absolutely right. And I think as humans, we are as a species, I think we all want to be, um, like we all want to know that somebody listens, somebody gives a shit about us. So... The power of listening, like listening to giving somebody opportunity to tell their story um, before we pitch in our own agenda or whatever. It's a key in any communication, I think. Mm -hmm. I had a really good um, episode with um, Alan Steven. You should check it out. He's a communication specialist and he's mm -hmm. uh, also a rapid trade profiler. So he's look at, uh, able to look at you know people's face and he'll be able to tell you like uh, – what kind of person you are, you know, based on oh, wrinkles. Right, yeah. face reading. Yeah. yeah, yeah, face reading. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very powerful. And he mm -hmm. consults uh, federal police, you know, for uh, all sorts of stuff. So anyway, um, just a bit of a, on a side trick. Um, Mark, once again, um, we are at an hour now and I usually like to keep it to an hour. So all right. we'll, we'll keep it that way. But it's been a pleasure having you in the show. And I'd like to uh, see if we can, you know, revisit another another hour, you know, in a year's time. And touch absolutely no the, this was this was really fun uh yeah it was, it was like a conversation between two buddies i loved it and, and i would you know you probably have a lot of interesting stories to tell from from the from the from the movie industry which we didn't yeah, really get into too much <laughs> <laughs> so we'll we'll leave that as a little uh, a little teaser for for the listeners to hang in there <laughs> stay subscribed to the podcast and <laughs> at some point we'll get we'll get mark back on the show Sounds uh, good awesome Mark, what are you up to for the rest of the day? Well, it's three in the morning and on the <laughs> East Coast of the United States, so sleep <laughs> is coming up for me. Uh, and then it's working on a, a, a pitch for, uh, for another production all through the weekend. Excellent. Sounds like a busy weekend. Yep. Awesome, mate. It's great. <laughs>